views and opinions expressed in this program are those of the participants and do not necessarily reflect the views of BronxNet or the program underwriters. BronxNet Television and WFUV Radio presents Strike a Chord, a panel discussion on the healing power of the arts. Hello, my name is George Bodarki. I'm the news director of NPR affiliate station WFUV, located on the Rose Hill campus of Fordham University here in the Bronx. Each quarter, WFUV works to raise awareness of a particular issue through our Strike Accord campaign. Past campaigns have focused on everything from family caregivers to at-risk youth to waterfronts. We're very pleased to be teaming up with BronxNet for our latest campaign focused on the healing power of the arts. The arts can play an important role in the rehabilitation of those who've suffered both mental and physical trauma, from stroke sufferers to survivors of domestic violence. With me today in the studio are some folks who know quite a bit about just how useful the arts can be as a healing and coping mechanism. Suzanne Tribe is a music therapist who works with the Healing Arts Program at Montefiore Health System. Lindsay Aaron is an art therapist at Montefiore. She works with adult patients within the oncology and palliative care departments. Ariel Edwards is the Community Arts Director at the Clay Art Center in Port Chester, New York. The Clay Art Center has a workshop for people living with cancer. It provides them with an opportunity to express themselves through the use of clay. And Dolores Anselmo is someone who has benefited from that workshop as well as other therapy programs. Ladies, thank you so much for joining me today. Thank you. Thank you for having us. So Lindsay, I want to start with you. Okay. What is art therapy exactly? It's a good question. Um, there's a lot of different definitions, but it really all boils down to one main point, that it's another form of self-expression through a creative process that uses the visual art, creative process, and therapeutic relationship to help support, maintain, and improve a patient's physical, mental, and emotional well-being. How wide are the mediums that you utilize in this area? Um, it's actually on a continuum from controlled to least controlled, and what defines a material as controlled is um, markers, for example, something with a predictable outcome, something you have um, control over. Um, and as well, paint would be more of a like, least controlled material. Uh, while you can control it with a paintbrush, it's still a little bit more fluid than a marker would be. So it really varies from anything from markers and paints, collage material, clay. Um, there's a, a wide a range of materials, yeah. You said the clay word, so let me turn <laughs> to Ariel here and talk about the Clay Art Center. Tell us about the Clay Art Center. Sure, it's a really incredible and unique place. It's the largest uh, single discipline art center, so we really focus only on clay. Um, and even though it's just the one art medium, it has a wide range as well. We do mosaics there, we do the potter's wheel, uh, we have sculptors and hand builders there. So we have 50 professional artists who mm -hmm. are in their studio spaces there, so it's an incredibly creative community, as well as serving about 12,000 people through uh, classes, workshops, and community arts outreach that includes public art projects as well as our clay as therapy programs. Now you work with a you work with Gilda's Club specifically when it comes to working with people living with cancer, correct? We do. Uh, it's all about really relationships. And so uh, Gilda's Club is one of our longest partners. We've been running a program there called Clay Expressions for the last six years. And they have really worked with us to not only identify people who feel like would really benefit from this impactful kind of art therapy experience, um, but to also uh, make suggestions for the program, um, to kind of throw their weight behind, making sure people know that it is free and accessible to all members of Gilda's Club, um, which is again a free program in and of itself. So um, we really have worked with them over the last few years to make sure that we are really transforming people's lives. Dolores, you are part of that program. Yes, I'm very fortunate to uh, have participated uh, and continue to participate in that Clay Expressions program. Uh, when I first started, I had no skills with, uh, with clay, had never worked with it before. Um, I'm a 20-year cancer survivor of both uh, breast and thyroid cancer. And I found in working with the clay and with the instructor from the Clay Arts Center, Dennis LeCool, um, she was able to guide myself and the other students into enabling us to express ourselves with clay and create things that we didn't think were possible before. And uh, what comes out is your expression of your emotion, your feelings, your inner spirit and uh, soul in the clay. So how were you able to express yourself through clay that you couldn't do through words? 
Um, it's just, I think, in, in working with the clay, there are things that may be going through you in, an, in a subconscious level that you're not fully aware of and that you might not easily express with, uh, with words. And I can show you a piece that I brought with me to uh, give that as an example. Please. Um, I, during the time uh, I was uh, working with Clay, I was going through a divorce. And I wanted to show that I was coming through that experience, that emotional experience of the divorce. And uh, I created a torso which I called Unbroken Spirit. And you can see it looks proud from the front and I created actually not arms but angel wings. But in the back I put a heart and in the heart is a stab wound with drops of blood. And afterwards when I discussed it with the instructor, you know, we agreed uh, or both got that feeling that this was coming out from my heart being stabbed you were from hurt. going through the divorce. <laughs> <Yeah>. So <laughs> that was, uh, you know, I didn't intend for that to come out, but that's what came out in, in my work. So, yeah, very expressive subconsciously. Suzanne, you work with music. You're a music therapist. Yes. How do you work with music to help people cope with illness and angst? Well, music, music therapy as a profession is a relatively new profession dating from the 1950s. And um, we use music in a clinical setting and therapeutically to address patients' needs, be they physical, emotional, cognitive. And uh, broadly speaking, music can be used as a medium to help energize or stimulate patients who are maybe low energy or having depression or anxiety. And music can also stimulate and as well soothe patients who, who are, you know, maybe uh, going through, through stressful situations, specifically in the hospital setting. And I work in the intensive care units, the surgical intensive care units, the transplant unit, palliative care unit. So patients are coming from surgery. There is physical pain and there is anxiety. And we have developed musical techniques to help the patients and the people um, be able to lower, decrease the perception of pain and to lower their anxiety. So give me an example of how you do that. All right. So. Um, for example, if I, and, I, and this is a bedside, so patients have their individual spaces in the uh, intensive care unit, and I'll uh, you know, I'll approach the patient, and, um, and they'll tell me, you know, share if they're going through pain, which they usually are, because this is surgery. And, uh, and we try to rate it, you know, from one to 10, what is the, the scale, the degree of the pain, and then the happy face to the frowny face, I know, right? <laughs> yes. And then I, um, I proposed to them if, um, if, we could, if I could guide them through, um, it's a mindfulness-based breathing relaxation technique. But the thing is that in music therapy, it's musically assisted. So we, um, we go through this focusing on one thing at a time, which is mindfulness-based. You focus on one thing at a time, and that one thing is your breath, your breathing, the inhale, the exhale, and finding a rhythm to your breathing. And once you find that rhythm, you can add an image, maybe of the ocean, a wave, an image that helps you in the inhale to feel that sense of vitality, but especially on the exhale to be able to let go, release, whatever you need to release, whether it's pain or anxiety or stressful thoughts. And then I, usually through song, I'll make, you know, I'll continue guiding this uh, meditation, but in music, singing, because that's the thing with music. If you sing something and you repeat it, it's, it doesn't feel like repetition. Mm -hmm. If you talk about something, once you've said it three times, it's repetitive. And um, 
What I found is that at the end of the session, the patients will say that the pain became lower, so we look at it on the scale. I also tell them that they can actually do it on their own. And what I find, and this is a thing with music, some of them say, oh, I've done meditation, but actually with the music, I was able to stay in that space and be with my breathing and be with my imagery and with my intention of releasing much longer. So then the effect in my body and my emotions is deeper. So I think that's, you know, one of the positive aspects of music that it, it, we are attuned to music from millennia so that music helps us to stay in that place that uh, maybe if it were just a discipline of breathing it it's hard especially if you're just out of surgery and mm -hmm. you know with all the medication so are you primarily working with pre-recorded music or are you getting people to create their own music as well At at this point, it's what we call a receptive music therapy intervention. Usually people are just out of surgery, they're sort of very weak, they are receiving pain medication, so I provide the music. Mm -hmm. I'll go into the room with a, with a guitar and find the chords that are appropriate for the relaxation and this rhythmic breathing, and then vocally I will sing um, to continue the relaxation, and then they can choose the music they like so that when they're on their own, they can listen to the music that they are attuned to and, and practice this technique uh, again. I understand you also work with the drums as well. I know, yes. <laughs> yes. And you get very excited about that apparently, so tell me about the drums. <laughs> Who doesn't like drumming? <laughs> yeah, so, but this is uh, drums used therapeutically. So, um, when it's group drumming, it's group empowerment drumming. I do, you know, drum circles for um, what we call associates, which is all the staff in the hospitals. And it can be a moment of gathering together, of release, of having a moment of um, r recreation. But also, I work with staff, associates in drum circles, staff who are caregivers in the, you know, the very intense units, palliative care, and uh, so that there the drumming becomes a therapeutic medium where people um, can express through the drumming what they need in that moment. So maybe it's a very soft meditative drumming where people can, after all the stress that they've been through and that they're going back through because this is you know stressful mm -hmm. work, but we love it, um, but be able to relax and, and uh, gather themselves. And at other times, people, you know, Everybody is different, so maybe the whatever stressful situation we've been going through, we need to release it, and it's on a very like uh, sensory motor level, like physical level of being able to play on that drum and release your energy in an organized way and together with others in a community. And then, you know, as you were asking about the, it's drumming is nonverbal, but mm -hmm. you're expressing a lot. So some people then will verbally express and, and you know, tell the story of what I they went through. You can express anger depending on mm -hmm. how heavy you're hitting or fear yes. or whatever that feeling might yes. be, or even feeling better by going softer with a drum, correct? Yes, yes. Yes, and then even like um, beating vigorously, like mm -hmm. you were saying, because of frustration or anger, but there's after a time of drumming together through the, this um, principle of entrainment, this sense of being together and drumming together can turn, transform that frustration into connection, joy, um, enthusiasm. Mm -hmm. And that's why I think therapy is this, we journey, we take this journey together. We mm -hmm. start off at a point where there is some form of displeasure, discomfort, um, and through, in the journey, we move towards a place of feeling more mm -hmm. well-being, mm -hmm. more relaxation or more energy according mm -hmm. to each one's needs. Ariel, I've read that the use of clay can be especially helpful in expressing anger and other feelings as well. Definitely, I think uh, clay is a very tactile medium and so you can hold you know, a moist lump of clay in your hands and it's gonna take on the temperature of your body. It's going to show your fingerprints. I mean, you can look at archeological objects from thousands of years ago and see the hand of the person who made it is still very present. 
And so I think that um, we have, uh, we begin the class with a meditation mm -hmm. with clay where they are creating a small pinch pot vessel and it's kind of becomes imbued with a lot of the thoughts and feelings that are happening, which I think Dolores can also speak more to that experience as well. Yeah, the, uh, my feeling is that the, your, your inner essence, your spirit comes through in the clay and uh, I, in the class that I've uh, been participating with this last time, I spoke to uh, several of the participants when we were picking up pieces from a recent exhibit at the Greenberg Library and I asked them if they would give me their words so that I could convey them today yeah. and if it's all right with Please. you, I'd like to express uh, one of the individuals said to me, uh, or wrote down, because these are all anonymous, uh, depression frequently sets in during or after cancer treatment. Clay expressions help me to focus on something other than my illness. Uh, another woman, with no breast, I felt lifeless. Doing something creative, as well as the camaraderie of the other women, has made me more accepting of my um, my bodily condition and my cancer care. Um, another woman said, art therapy aids in all kinds of healing, physical and mental. It can take you from your worries to a place that is peaceful, calm, or even whimsical. Um, I, another woman said, for three hours I did not think of cancer. Even if it was not a good day, I dragged myself there. It has been a joy to do this and something that I had never done before and I love it. Another woman expressed herself, when we work with clay, we often speak of our illnesses. Not many words are needed. We are supported and comforted by the fact that many of us have experienced similar treatments, side effects, etc. And we know what e each person has gone through. Just and being there, you know you're yeah, not there, alone. There's a special bonding that mm -hmm. goes on. And I thought this was interesting that our instructor um, happened to um, be told this by one of the students in, in a previous class who is a cancer patient but had lost his sight from something other than cancer. And he said that since working with clay, it has affected his perception of the world around him. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I thought that was really insightful. And the, the, this instructor uh, guides us and is being, we're very present in the moment, you know, uh, and we have this special bonding that occurs amongst the students and the, and the, and the staff. Um, and m one of my feelings is that, again, the spirit, the soul, and the emotions are, are given the freedom to create and express our innermost being mm -hmm. in, in our clay expressions. Lindsay, there's no doubt when you're in a hospital, it can be very scary, very intimidating. I would imagine that a lot of this is also simply about giving people some control. You can control what you're working with. You can control the materials. You can control what you want to do with those materials. Mm -hmm, exactly. Um, and so with every material, each, each material elicits a different emotion. So depending on a reason for referral, whether it's anxiety or pain management, I would offer um, one, uh, two to three materials to a patient that I know would help in that um, situation. Um, and by offering the, the options, it gives the, the patient control over choosing. Um, it also gives them control over saying no entirely and not engaging in a session, which I think is extremely empowering for them. Being in the hospital, you have no opportunity to ever say no. You are there for, because you're sick and the doctors are, are there to help you. Whether it's painful um, procedures coming up, you, you need it um, and you can't really say no. So just that really, those two letters are very, very powerful. So completely turning a session down, it's I'm open to it and I welcome it and I appreciate it and I let the patients know that it's okay. Um, but also just, Cre creating your own work um, with no real directive, kind of just an, a free expression, is giving them control over something to engage in and make and express themselves in a way that they may not be able to really do verbally. Um, mm -hmm. Emotions are stored in a nonverbal way, so it's likely that they'd be expressed in a nonverbal way, which is not to say that we don't speak in the session. Um, at the end of the session, usually a discussion may come up, um, but if I feel a, a patient has really had their, their time to express themselves and no further discussion is needed, then that's okay. But um, 
the whole session really is to help empower and reinstall a sense of control. Yeah. When someone's sick and in the hospital, mm -hmm. of course, it could also take a toll on the family. Mm -hmm. Do you involve the family in art therapy sessions as well, the yeah, loved ones? Yeah, definitely. Um, there's a lot of times when patients are in the middle of their visiting hours with, with family and friends, and I welcome everyone to be involved. And I have a lot of collaborative directives on hand where they can create these drawings together as a scribble drawing where they both are scribbling on one piece of paper, then we rip the paper or cut the paper in half or into however many pieces of family members there are. Everyone creates their own collage um, on their paper and then it's actually put back together like a puzzle. So everyone's unique t um, take on the experience is there and yet it all comes together to create one really great piece of work. Um, I also work with the caregiver support group at Montefiore Hospital, so that's for patients for caregivers of patients that are very, very um, ill, and it's an opportunity for them to really just create work um, in an almost mindless way, not really having to think or worry and really take time for them themselves, um, because every support needs support, um, for lack of better words. And so, yeah, everyone is really, everyone's open to the process, um, and everyone is also welcome to it, too. Is there a particular story that you can share with us where you saw a pretty major breakthrough through art? Yeah, definitely. Um, kind of going back to the directive I just explained of the scribble drawing, I worked with a patient um, who was through palliative care. Uh, he was with his wife visiting, um, or the wife, I'm sorry, was visiting him, and they engaged in the scribble drawing together that they cut in half, they each had their own um, collaged um, materials and they put words from magazines on it. They came together and I also saw as they were creating their work, they were laughing, giggling, uh, reminiscing on times outside of the hospital walls. And the focus, um, the wife told me, was for the first time, their discussion was not about the illness. It wasn't about the hospital. It was about their life. And that in general, just the emotion of that, helps internally in the, in the body and just the minds. Everything is connected. And they were just, it really reconnected them. Um, and I was able to see that and not only see it, they, they told me in the end, but it was very prominent by their expressions, yeah. Dolores, I know that art has helped you mm -hmm. beyond your divorce and beyond right. your cancer as well. Your son took his own life and art helped you through that as well? Yes, it did. Uh, I, we recently were given uh, the opportunity mm. to create uh, pieces of the, um, uh, of the clay into a body form. And what I did was something a little bit different. Uh, I took the clay and created two figures. And it happened to be uh, right at the time of my son's birthday. And uh, ha with him ha being passed for such a long time, but still he was very much present in my mind and, and missing him. And uh, what came out was a piece of, I started it as a mother and child figure, but uh, eventually it turned out into an angel with the child being embraced by the angel. Mm -hmm. And it was, I feel, very representative of where my, my mind was, my heart, my soul were with him, even though he wasn't present with me on the earth any longer. But uh, that was healing for me to get through that that day and uh, and to be able to express it. And uh, that wasn't really what I started in mind with, but that was what came out. And that's why I said it's a lot of times it's the inner inner feeling, inner soul that comes out. Uh, and as I've seen it with the drumming, I've participated in drumming circles as well. Um, and different types of art therapy, uh, collage work, and so forth. Um, and it's um, sometimes the humor comes out. Uh, sometimes it's the um, uh, you're leaving almost in a way a legacy if for your grandchildren, for your children, for your for your significant other in your artwork and uh, it, it's just, it, I've seen it bring people closer together as you said, you know. Mm -hmm. It just, uh, the connection is there, the bonding is there because people were not able to express themselves in other wor ways, in, in a verbal sense, but through this artwork or drumming or music, 
it, it just comes out and it, and it embodies. And I uh, definitely feel that that has helped me to survive for 20 years. Ariel, I would imagine you see a wide range of expression mm -hmm. coming out of the workshops. It's really incredible, and, and I think mm -hmm. I, I am always transfixed by this process. Uh, each session of the class is mm -hmm. about 10 weeks long, and so we really, on the first day, we do self-introductions, and we do a kind of a meditative experience, and you really hear people say, you know, hello, my name is, and this is, this is what I have, this is my illness and what I'm dealing with. Mm -hmm. And I really feel like by the end of a few sessions, those same people were coming back and saying, hello, my name is, this is the art that I make. And so mm -hmm. it was something that how they identified as their illness had kind of gone to the back and they were artists and they were kind of articulating this artistic vision. Um, and they were able to really claim space and time for themselves, which is something mm -hmm. I heard you also mention. And I think it's universal to the process, no matter what you are working with. Mm -hmm. It gives you time to express yourself. It gives you blank space for you to really think about yourself and your relationship with others and really connect. Yeah, George, what I've seen in the class uh, is that, um, you know, in creating our own pieces and what's coming out, sometimes we'll go around the class, you know, we'll take a break from our mm -hmm. own work and we'll go around and look at what the other individuals are creating and then that will in turn inspire us to maybe work on our piece a little bit differently or give us ideas for the next piece that we want to work on. So there's a, you know, a real connection there as far as an inspirational connection with others. I'm, I'm curious, we only have a couple of minutes left. What What's involved with becoming a music therapist and art therapist? Do you, be, do you need to be schooled both in art and psychology? Yeah, <laughs> Suzanne? <laughs> <laughs> yes. <clears throat> Let's see. Specifically with music therapy, um, we all know that music and health, the connection between music and health is something that has existed. It's perennial. But uh, at the end of you know, after World War II, when the veterans returned, there were volunteer musicians in the hospitals and they started seeing that actually the music, the music held, had power and helped lower, let's say, the pain and also lower emotional stress. So then the act academic research of, you know, how is it that music has this effect on health and well-being started up at the Michigan University and the first career of music therapy was established in 1944. Mm -hmm. And then in 1950, we have the first National American Music Therapy Association. Now it has a different name, but it's from since 1950, it's like music therapy as a profession exists. Mm -hmm. So um, here in the United States, so here in the United States, we study at the bachelor's level and then at the master's level the career of music therapy, which implies knowledge and practice of music right. and knowledge of therapy, uh, psychotherapy, and there are a lot of different approaches in psychotherapy, um, mm -hmm. you know, more Freudian, and um, so we have to have a grasp on all of them. Mm -hmm. And then when we do our internship, which is part of, you know, getting our master's degree here in, in New York, has very high standards, yeah. um, we are applying um, this in clinical settings and with supervision from from people who have their license and then once we get our board certification we have to follow on and get a, a license which implies another 1,500 hours of supervised work as a music therapist so I mean it's uh, it's very s strict I think uh, New York State has the highest like uh, level of uh, uh, requirements but it is uh, you know it is part of one's uh, formation, but also a protection for the people receiving And the, the benefits sessions. are quite uh. profound. That's something certainly that is quite evident. I want to thank you all mm -hmm. for taking the time to be with us and talking about this very important issue. So thank you so much. Thank, thank you, Joanne. Thank, thank, thank you. Thank That's you. That's all the time we have for this special collaboration between public radio station WFUV and BronxNet, focusing on the healing power of the arts. I want to thank our guests, Suzanne Tribe, Lindsay Aaron, Ariel Edwards, and Dolores Anselmo. For more information about the programs they're involved with or to simply find out more about WFUV's Strike Accord campaign, visit WFUV.org slash Strike Accord. I'm George Bodarki. Thanks so much for being with us.